Hey YouTube, it's Zoe. You probably don't recognize me. One, because I've been gone for a century. Sorry about that. And two, I cut off all of my hair. Not sure if you could tell. It was a really subtle change, but I kind of feel like I should be in the diviners. Evie O'Neill, watch out because I'm taking your job. Positively. Before we get into me talking about the 31 books I think I've read this past summer that I haven't talked about on my channel yet, I'm going to give you a little explanation and explain why I have been gone because I've gotten a lot of DMs on Twitter and Instagram asking, did I stop making videos? And that made me really sad because I didn't intend to take this break. I didn't intend to just ghost all of you. I am figuring my life out, becoming more of an adult and going on job interviews, figuring out my financial stuff and all of that. It took a lot of my brain power and creativity and confidence, so I didn't feel up to it. I've explained this before, but making videos takes so much out of me. I love it. I love making videos. I love getting to know all of you all and talking about books, but I am such a perfectionist that it always turns more into a chore. I focus so much on making it a perfect video that I forget that it's supposed to be fun. And they don't even turn out perfectly in the end. So why am I stressing myself out? So the moral of the story is I want to start having fun with my channel again and I'm not going to lower the qualities of the videos, but I am going to lower the expectations I have started to place upon myself over the years. So I might not be as eloquent as I was before because I would write down bullet points and I would re-say sentences again and again until they came out perfectly. Now I am ready. I am ready to rumble, lower the stakes, and just chat about books, which is what my channel was supposed to be about from the beginning. Let's get on to the point of this video and review the 31 books that I read this past summer. It is supposedly fall or autumn now, but in Florida it is literally how it's like 89 degrees outside. So I tried to wear some orange, can't wear long sleeves. I have a pumpkin right here. This is as fall as we're going to get. Now we are going to start with stats. I love statistics. Let's evaluate and calculate how my summer reading went. From July to September, I read 31 books. Four of them were audiobooks because I went through my Audible account and I saw that I had purchased books back in the day, months and months, sometimes years ago, and I still hadn't read them. I wanted to get my money's worth. And 11 of these 31 books were graphic novels. I am a graphic novel fiend nowadays. Of these books, I read 9,880 pages of finished books, but I did start quite a few books and I ended up DNFing them. I can't even remember all the ones that I started. So I'm going to put a chart right here of the release years of the books that I read. Most of them were released in the past four years, so I am keeping up to date with my releases, but I did read some older ones. And then here is a chart of the ratings of the books, and I had a great reading season. I read so many five-star books. I did reread a lot of books during the summer, and I didn't read anything below a two-star, so not too shabby of a reading season, wow. A good portion of the books that I read during the summer, I read for live shows. I will include all of the links to all of the live shows down below in the description box so you can watch those and hear me spoil everything. So the first book I read in July was The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. This was actually one of the books that I listened to via audiobook. It is narrated by Elizabeth Acevedo herself, and she is an award-winning slam poet. This book is told in verse, so it is an amazing experience. This follows a high school sophomore named Ziamara, who is a child of Dominican immigrants growing up in Harlem. She's questioning her religion because her mother is very conservative and very devout. She's questioning her relationship with her body and those who sexualize it. She's really trying to figure out who she is, trying to find herself, and she comes across slam poetry and projects her thoughts and feelings into that. Although she has to keep 
Poetry a Secret from her mother. The audiobook for this is only, I think, three and a half hours long. I listened to it at one speed, regular speed. I usually listen to audiobooks between 1.5 to 2 times speed, but this I wanted to take in the whole picture and read it in real time. I wanted it to be at the speed and the cadence and the rhythm that Elizabeth Acevedo decided that it should be told. This starts off kind of a slice of life narrative. Not much is happening to drive the plot forward. We're just getting to know Ziamara. But then things start happening and you realize just how invested you are in the story. I was just driving around my area for three and a half hours listening to this because I was in such a zone with this story. I audibly gasped a few times because it took me by surprise. I really enjoyed it. I gave it four out of five stars. The only reason why I docked it down a little bit is because I thought the ending wrapped up a little bit too quickly. All of a sudden, there was a lot of drama, and then whoop, okay, everything's fine now. But I still really enjoyed it. I still recommend that anybody who is even a little bit interested in this, pick it up. Okay, so the next book I have to talk about, I, I know all of you are going to be quite shocked that I haven't actually read it before now, but now I have, so you don't need to worry about me. I finally read Six of Crows by Leigh Bardugo, obviously gave it five out of five stars. This was even more satisfying because I forced myself to read all of the original Grisha trilogy, which wasn't a bad time, it was just unpleasant. I wasn't having a lot of fun and I knew that the only reason why I continued with that was one, because of Nikolai, love Nikolai, but two, because I knew that I would finally get to this darn series and I did. I love all of the characters so much and just yesterday we got news of the casting of this book and now they're in production for the Netflix series. Now after hearing the news about the casting and seeing that Ben Barnes, Prince Caspian, is the Darkling, I suddenly care much more about the Darkling than I did. Alina looks amazing. Jasper, yes. Kaz, yes. Those cheekbones. Ooh. Inej? Inej. Mal could give or take. I mean, maybe they'll give him more personality in the series. Maybe this actor has so much charisma and we don't even know. Anyway, I am so happy that I finally read this. I actually was planning on vlogging my experience of reading this, but I I read it way too quickly and I didn't want to stop to, to vlog clips. I just wanted to get through the story because it consumed me, body and soul. But I do have notes that I took while I was reading it that I will read out to you all now. So the first note is this feels like X-Men. Ah, what just happened? Next note is I already love Inej. Very true. I was crying when we got to No Mourners, No Funerals. I actually spent quite um, a long time looking at fan art. Instead of vlogging, I did stop reading to look at fan art, but it was very necessary to the reading process. I was connected to the characters within 50 pages of this book, more so than three books of the Grisha trilogy, so that really tells you how much Leigh Bardugo progressed through her writing, but all of you knew this because you've already read this book. I have not read Crooked Kingdom yet, but we're not going to talk about that. I said in all caps, I love character focused books with complex backstories, morally gray characters who are good people doing bad things. I love them. That is the entire mood for this book. There's not a lot of actual action happening. I mean, there is, but most of it is bantering and getting to know the characters, them planning a heist. I love every single one of the characters. Matthias? less so than the others, but Jesper. I love Jesper and Inej and oh, Nina. <sighs> Usually when I read series, I come up with so many dumb theories of how everything is going to end up, but with this book, I didn't really do that. I was just along for the ride, ready to let Lee Bardugo take the wheel. Now that we have the casting news though, I am ready to read Crooked Kingdom. I talked to Hannah yesterday and she said, oh my gosh, I am really disappointed in you because you haven't read Crooked Kingdom yet because it's the book. 
So I felt um, really chastised, but also really motivated to read the last book. This wasn't a coherent review because I wasn't very coherent when I was reading the book. I was in a fangirl haze. The next book I read was decidedly less exciting for me to read, even though it's technically a thriller and it should be thrilling. That was You by Caroline Kepnes. I gave it three out of five stars. I would have given the beginning closer to five stars, but as the story progressed, it got boring to tell you the truth. I love the idea of the story where everybody, including the victims of this serial killer stalker, everybody is flawed. Nobody is a particularly good character, so the serial killer slash stalker can kind of justify the things that he's doing. And I know it made some people like the serial killer slash stalker, but I think that's because Santino Fontana of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and Frozen, uh, he narrates the audiobook and he has a really nice voice, so maybe that got some people on board. And also Penn Badgley played him in the TV series and he's handsome. So maybe that's why people liked a serial killer slash stalker, but um... No. I also like that it was told in second person, like the main character, the serial killer slash stalker, was talking to the person he was stalking and it kind of felt like you were the one being stalked. It did get me at first. I was freaked out. But then it was just like his every day, him living his life. I didn't come to this story about serial killing and stalking and things that should be scary to hear about him meeting regular people and living his life. I don't care about his life. He's evil. I care about the evil things that he's done. I haven't watched the TV show, but honestly, I feel no need to continue with this story in an adaptation or read the sequel because I've heard really bad things about the sequel. I've read better thrillers. And that's that. Next, I read Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe by Benjamin Alire Sainz. I gave this four out of five stars. This was another book that I listened to via audiobook because I had the audiobook for so long and never actually got around to reading it until now. But it is narrated by Lin-Manuel Miranda. He did such a good job. He really made the prose feel like poetry. He really made it less pretentious than I think it would have been if I physically read it because it did start to sound a little bit John Greeny. Not that that's a bad thing, I just preferred hearing it from Lin-Manuel Miranda. This follows two Mexican-American teens named Aristotle and Dante who are growing up in El Paso, Texas in the 1980s. They're both quite lonely and isolated until they find each other. They start to figure out their identities, their sexuality, their relationships with their friends, friends and family together. They really get each other on a deep level even when factors are keeping them apart. There's not a lot of plot to this story. It kind of reminds me of The Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chbosky, where most of the story is following a friendship and an internal evolution. A metamorphosis, if you will, like Hilary Duff. If you're not a fan of slower paced, definitely character focused books, you might not like this, but I like both of those. So it still kept my attention, especially with Lin-Manuel Miranda narrating it all to me. So all in all, I had a really pleasant experience. I did tear up a few times listening to this and I think this can be a really impactful book for a lot of people. It has already been a really impactful book since it came out in 2012, I believe, because it has amazing own voices, Mexican-American and gay representation. So definitely check it out. The next book is boring, so I'm not going to focus on it too much. It is a nonfiction writing craft book called Save the Cat Writes a Novel by Jessica Brody. This is all about how to structure a compelling novel, how to write different genres and where to put the beats of the novel. I do want to write a completed book one day, so I love doing research every now and then on how to write something that's actually interesting, that people might actually read. This was I gave it five out of five stars. This was an amazing text. I am going to keep this book on my shelf for the foreseeable future because I feel like it has such rereadability to it. I feel like this will be 
an amazing resource for when I start to structure a novel and even after I finish writing a book, how I can make it more compelling to read. So if you are a writer, an aspiring writer, if you've already written quite a few books, I feel like this will be invaluable. The next book I read, I did not like. <laughs> pretty much at all. I gave it two out of five stars and the sad thing is that I read it for Bookmarked Book Club. So there's an entire live show of me complaining about this book, but I do have examples. So if you want to know more of why I don't like the book, I will leave that live show link down below. I don't think I gave you the name of the book. <laughs> it was Wicked Fox by Kat Cho. I had such high expectations for this. I thought that the synopsis on the back sounded amazing. It is set in modern day Seoul and it follows an 18 year old Gumiho that is a nine tailed fox. It is part of Korean mythology and Gumihos are known to devour the souls of men. Our Gumiho named Gumi Young, she comes across a boy in the forest one day who is going to be killed by a goblin. She ends up saving his life and loses her Gumiho bead in the process, which means that her eternal life is in jeopardy. Mi Young falls in love with this boy and it turns into much more of a romance than an actual fantasy book. Um, also I didn't care about any of the characters. I thought that this plot went all over the place. There were quite a few villains and I don't feel like this book was plotted very well because this could have been like an epic Twilight book where there is like the romance at the forefront. She's basically Edward. She has to decide whether or not to fall in love with this boy or to live forever and continue killing men to live forever. But instead it ends up following Jihoon for quite a long time and he was boring. She was boring too. No one really had a personality and the fact was I really wanted to know more about the Korean mythology behind the legends of the Gumihos. The parts where we learn more about the mythology, there are little sections between the chapters, those are the best parts of the book. But then we went on to this really bland and boring <laughs> romance. Apparently Kat Cho was really influenced by K-drama romances, but in K-dramas I care about the characters. In this, I wanted more fantasy. I usually don't say that about fantasy books, that I wanted more fantasy aspects. I usually love the parts where it is more of a contemporary, where I can connect to the characters. But in this, I wanted to see some nine-tailed foxes just ravaging upon men. Come on. The drama in the fantasy aspect, her losing her fox bead, I feel like that dragged on for so long. It didn't feel like it was life or death that she lost her fox bead. That could have been an interesting place to start the story. This was also the first book in a series. I don't really know how they're going to continue this. I am not going to read the second book. If I were to read this on my own, I would have DNF'd it earlier than halfway through the story. The concept of this book, amazing. Korean mythology plus like some K-drama and Twilight inspirations like that would have banged. But instead we got kind of a bland contemporary where everyone was slowly dying. <laughs> including me while I was reading it. After that though, I read books that I really enjoyed and made my heart so happy. I read Heartstopper Volume 1 and Volume 2 by Alice Oseman. I gave both of these four out of five stars. A wholesome story about two boys falling in love in high school. One of the boys named Nick, he is a popular jock in the high school. They're in England. What is it called? Second form? That sounds wrong. But throughout the novels, he realizes that he is bisexual. His love interest named Nick is gay and so cute. Oh my gosh, they're both so cute. There are barriers on the relationship only because they're not ready to come forward with the relationship, but there's not relationship drama in the relationship. They are perfect together and they are so supportive. 
so accepting of one another. Charlie is not rushing Nick. That's all I'm going to say. I'm, I don't really feel like any of these are spoilers but seeing their love story blossom was amazing. So uplifting, definitely a love story that we need nowadays. At the ends of these books, there are little statistics about all of the characters inside. So we learn what Hogwarts house each character would be in, which um, Myers-Briggs. I love just the extra little tidbits. I feel like I'm picking a video game character or something like that. The next two books were two more graphic novels. They are Saga Volume 5 and Volume 6 by Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples. I am slowly making my way through the series. I gave Volume 5 3 out of 5 stars and I gave Volume 6 4 out of five stars. I think volume six has been one of my favorites of the entire series so far because there is a time jump. No longer are we slowly making our way through it and more drama is being added again and again on this same little block of time. Our main little girl named Hazel, she is in preschool or kindergarten so it's been a few years. We get to see where her family is nowadays and where the other I can't say any of this without spoiling you. It really got the momentum back up. It got me excited in the story again. I really like how unique and diverse all of the characters are. They are the reason why I keep coming back to the story even with all of the graphic violence and sexual acts, there's drug use, and there's just a lot in this story that really gets me down sometimes when I'm reading it, but it's the characters. They're the reason why I feel compelled to continue on. Then in August for the Newt's Magical Readathon, which I failed, by the way, I am not an unspeakable in the Ministry of Magic. I'm sure I can qualify for one of the positions because I did read, I just didn't read all of the books I was supposed to read. I was in a rut, we had family staying, so I didn't continue on with reading or with vlogging. I'm sorry about that. I know a lot of you were looking forward to the vlogs, but I did read some good books. The first one, which you saw me talk about in my first and only vlog, was With the Fire on High by Elizabeth Acevedo. This follows a high school senior named Imani who is all about food. She wants to be a chef when she gets older, but she's not sure how she's going to be able to pursue her dreams while also being the mother to her young child. She got pregnant while in freshman year. She's still on relatively good terms with the father, but they're no longer together. She lives with her grandmother, who sometimes Sometimes helps take care of her child, but she is the primary caregiver while also trying to finish high school and wondering about college and figuring out what she is going to do with her life, how far she can go in pursuing her dreams while also still being a good mother and being responsible. Unlike The Poet X, this is written in prose instead of in verse, so it's more of a typical YA novel. Not much was actually happening in this story, not much was moving the plot forward. The only things really keeping me invested in the story were her relationships. I love her complex relationships with her dad and the father of her child, her grandma even. I also really enjoyed her relationship with the person she gets in the relationship with. It is so nice. There is, again, not a lot of drama in it. I love drama-free relationships in books. I feel like in YA, all we get is drama. They look at each other once and they're like, okay, we're in a relationship, but also I hate you. This is the relationship that she deserves, and I'm so happy for both of them. And the other thing was the cooking. Her relationship with food, it got me so hungry while reading this. There are actual recipes in here, honestly. I, I I might want to try some of them. The ending wrapped up a little bit too concisely, too quickly. Everything was a little bit too perfect. I love happy endings, but I feel like I need to work towards that ending. I need there to be a lot of struggle in the book. I need the ending to be a lot of drama and they clawed their way to that happy ending. But here, it just happened. So on paper, this was a satisfying ending, but it wasn't satisfying in my soul. Okay, so the next three are three graphic novels that I have become totally obsessed with and I want my entire room to just be covered with the art from these books because oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I have found a new religion. I am a follower of Katie O'Neill. 
Boy howdy, these are amazing. <laughs> these are middle grade graphic novels that are so cute and wholesome, which is the name of the game, I guess, for my reading lately. I just need things that make me feel nice and cozy because I'm becoming an adult and it's sad and depressing, so I need something that makes me feel like a kid again. I gave all of these five out of five stars, not only because I absolutely love this art style. Let me just show you. Let me just show you how cute this art style is. It's cartoony and colorful. The tea dragons are like little Pokemon. The cutest Pokemon that you could ever dream about. I really wanted to get a plushie of Chamomile, the little tea dragon right here, but they are sold out, which is very rude because I want to be a child with a plushie. They are for every age, so you can read this to a child and they will have a really nice time and get to know some good messages, but when you're an adult, it's it's deep as well. So we have this one right here, which I just read, Aquacore and Cove. This is about oceanic conservation and how although industries are the number one causes for pollution and climate change, it's not just on the industries to change, although they do desperately need to change. Just because you don't feel like you can make a big difference doesn't mean you can't try and it doesn't mean it's not every person's responsibility to do better. This also deals with depression and loss of a parent. So I really enjoy this because there are cute little aquacorns. As you can see right here, they live in a colony underneath the ocean. That's what I like. I like to look at pretty things and cry. <laughs> but the tea dragons though, I have the tea dragon society and the tea dragon festival. So these tea dragons are like little pets. You take care of them and if you treat them right, then you can cultivate the tea from the top of their heads and brew it and you will see the memories from the tea dragons. I love how diverse all of these books are. We have quite a few LGBTQ plus couples and characters in the sequel, The Tea Dragon Festival, which just came out. We have a deaf character and the village speak ASL to the character within the book. I love these. I will read anything else that Katie O'Neill ever writes. The best graphic novels that I have read ever? Ever? Yes. I would say so. <laughs> then I read Salt to the Sea by Ruta Sepetys, which is a World War II historical fiction. However, it's not about the same aspects of World War II as so many other historical fictions are. It follows four refugees in Eastern Europe in 1945 who are trying to flee the war on a ship called the Wilhelm Guslav. However, that ship sinks. As it says on the back, it is a forgotten tragedy that was six times deadlier than the Titanic. That's why I loved this book because it really brought to light a tragedy that nobody really talks about, no one focuses on. I was not taught this in history class at all. And most of these characters are refugees. They are not soldiers. They're not fighting for any cause. They're just trying to survive. This book is told in four perspectives. All of them are hiding aspects from their past. They come to light throughout the novel. We really get to know them and they start to form bonds together. There's also a Nazi character named Alfred. I didn't, he, he was mm, the worst part of the book. If you saw my first news vlog, you know how much I sobbed over this book. It was the ending I was not expecting at all. I was pleasantly surprised. I gave this 4.5 out of five stars and the only reason why I docked off that half of a star is because it is told in four different perspectives and they're very short chapters. We really switch between all of their point of views in a particular scenario, and I feel like we don't really get to truly know any one of the characters. We know their personalities, we know their backstories, but I I wanted to feel like I was them in this scenario. I hear that all of Ruta Sepetti's books focus on aspects of history that not a lot of people talk about or know about, that she's bringing neglected voices to light, and I am really excited to read some more of her because I think that's such an important and interesting 
thing to read about. I don't just want to hear the same stories again and again. I want to learn something. So the next book I read wasn't really a book at all. It was a webcomic called Save Me by BTS, or it starred BTS. It was not written by BTS, but it tells the storyline of all of BTS's music videos. It brings it into comic form. And I thought it was a really interesting idea. I had a lot of fun sitting down, listening to BTS and reading this comic, but I gave it three out of five stars because the story is so repetitive, so repetitive. It tells the story of our main character, Jin, who is trying to save all of his six friends from deadly circumstances. He could travel in time to go back and save all of them, but he had to go back in time, like honestly, 25 times in this one comic. Starting off, I felt so fresh. I was like, yeah, let's listen to BTS and read about like what the music video's timeline is supposed to be, what the whole story, their concept is supposed to be. But near the end, I felt like a haggard old woman. I was like, ah, oh, here we go again. I didn't even care if they died this time because I knew that Jin could just go back. So interesting concept, but I felt like it was a waste of time near the end. It could have been half the length easily. Though there were important messages in it, there was child abuse, there was depression, and suicide. Honestly, if you're not feeling the best mental health wise, I would say steer clear of this until you're feeling better because things were quite graphic at times. Maybe if you're a bigger BTS fan than I am, you will enjoy spending a lot of time with your boys. I'm more of a casual BTS fan. I just wanted it to be over. <laughs> the next book I read was Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston, which has been so popular on booktube for the past couple of months, and for good reason. This is such an addictive read with so many layers to it. I gave it four out of five stars. So this follows Alex, who is the first son of the United States. His mom is the first female president of the US, and it follows Henry, who who is a prince of England. They fall in love. It's kind of enemies to lovers. It wasn't a true like, I hate you, I want to kill you and murder you. It's more like, you're the worst and I, I resent you. It's resentment to lovers. I love the political aspect of this book. It took far more of the page time than I was expecting. I expected kind of rumblings of politics in the background, but most of it focusing on their relationship and their friendship developing. But no, our main character, Alex, he really wants to be a politician when he grows up. He really wants to dive first into politics and be a voice for the people. So he is studying international relations in college and he's really wanting to play a bigger role in his mom's presidency. There's a lot of politics in here and I was ready for it. I love romances that don't just focus on the romance. It focuses either on their schooling or their job or there's family drama or something. And this had Alex graduating from university. It had him wanting to start a job, his relationship with his family and his romance as well. So great. Although we didn't get too many secondary characters or the secondary characters that we did have didn't have a lot of page time. I really wanted more of his sister and his best friend. You can't have everything. Also Henry and Alex did have again a nice healthy relationship. We love it. Although there was quite a lot of drama in the relationship but a lot of that was external. They didn't bicker a lot. They weren't really like pushing each other's buttons. A lot of it was because they are the first son and a prince of England and they can't really be together without jumping a lot of hurdles. But the way that this book was written, I kept getting pulled out of the story again and again. It's told in third person present, which is such a weird perspective to read. So it's like Alex is doing this. Alex is not just angry anymore, he is sad too. And usually contemporaries are first person, so I kept on thinking that if it's written in this format, if it's written in third person, maybe we do also get the perspective of Henry. That would be really interesting, reading from both of their point of views. But no, it's just told from Alex's perspective 
in third person. Maybe Casey McQuiston wrote it in third person because it's not own voices, they're not a bisexual man. I mean, if you're gonna do that, do it in third person past. I don't know why that really got on my nerves, but every time I would read something like Alex is doing something, it made me feel disconnected from both the story and from Alex himself. I felt like I couldn't really get into his emotions. This is a great story. I think this is, again, a really important story, and this really touched so many people's hearts. Haley gave it five out of five stars. Chelsea from Chelsea Darling Reads she gave it five out of five stars. I'm really picky about my point of views, I guess. I did convince my dad to read this though because he heard that it was about politics. <laughs> So he started reading it. Um, he was really surprised by the amount of uh, sexually explicit things that happen in here, but ultimately he enjoyed himself. So yay! I am definitely going to pick up more from Casey McQuiston in the future though because besides the point of view, the writing was great. The next four books are Harry Potter books. They are rereads, so I'm not really going to talk about them, except for one of the books that I read was Harry Potter and the Cursed Child by J.K. Rowling. I gave it two out of five stars. Why, why did I read it? Why did I read it? Because I didn't believe that people were being serious when they said it was terrible and destroyed the series. I had to see it for myself, and I saw it for myself. And I am sad. You know, the reason why I'm mad is because JK Rowling said on Twitter that this was canon. If she just said, oh, this is a nice bit of fan fiction, we just wanted to make a play, and I didn't really have a hand in writing the story, like, whatever, it's just a play. But no, she, she went on Twitter and said, this is canon, live with it. Okay, but I'm sorry, your new canon does not fit with the old canon. There are so many plot holes, so many things that could not have happened. Time turners do not work this way. I know it's a new special time turner, but if something happened, it happened the whole time. Cedric Diggory was this way the whole time. No! Not my Robert Pattinson! I did start vlogging for the Newt's Magical Readathon week two, so I have some extra reading vlog clips. Enjoy my real time reading thoughts. Okay, so initial thoughts I love Scorpius. So far, he is my favorite character. He is so cute and nerdy. Also, I think seeing the show would be such a unique experience because they have to use practical effects for all of the magic, unlike the movies where it was mostly all CGI. Not too sure how the plot of this book is going to go. So I am on page 36 and I'm calling it right now that Delphine is Voldemort's secret daughter. Not too sure how she is a daughter because he couldn't experience love because of his mom taking a love potion to trick Tom Riddle Sr. into being in a relationship with her. So like, how did that occur? Who's the mom? But she is a suspiciously new character. All of the other characters we've met so far have just been people that we knew about from the original Harry Potter books or from the Harry Potter books. This is not an official Harry Potter book. She's definitely sketchy and she is the right age. Also, I do like the theme of this book so far, exploring what it's like to be a child of someone extremely famous and having to live up to those expectations, both positive in the case of Albus and negative in the case of Scorpius. People are just assuming things about them without actually getting to know them and how claustrophobic that must be. I am going to remain optimistic. I'm not going to write this off just because my friends and family have written it off, but I am extremely worried because they brought back time turners and in the fifth book, J.K. Rowling explicitly destroyed all of them on purpose in the Ministry of Magic because she knew it would cause so many plot holes. If they use Polyjuice Potion in this book, I am going to riot because they cannot have two of the most plot convenient devices in the Harry Potter history used in this play. No, please come up with different plot devices. So on page 41, Harry says that he wishes 
that Albus was not his son. Why is Harry such like a crap dad in this book? Harry is such a sweet family loving kid. I know he's like 40 years old in this, but whatever. Why are all of the characters so weird in this so far? I mean, I'm only 40 pages in, so maybe other things happen. This was not written by JK Rowling, even though it says that it's written by JK Rowling. It's not sitting right with me. This is not what I was expecting them to be like all grown up. And Hermione is not the Minister of Magic, right? Of the original Harry Potter characters, I think that Draco is the closest to what I would expect Draco to be like grown up because he's not, you know, the bratty kid he was at Hogwarts. He's more mature, but also he's still not taking any of Harry's crap. Okay, so I just got... <laughs> direction they were taking things and then the trolley witch <laughs> she is fucking casting grenades what? what the heck she had spike hands how did she get to the top of the train with her trolley with spike hands how did on top of a moving vehicle so did she like <laughs> how did she get on top of the train and also why did she turn <laughs> why did she invent exploding food and she's serving them to kids <laughs> who asked for this <laughs> i'm having a breakdown they're using polyjuice potion why am i surprised so Albus is 14 years old and he kissed his aunt Hermione. That's his first instinct for diversion is to firmly kiss her. That's the specific words in this play. Firmly kissed her and then immediately says let's have another baby. What? That is your aunt. What the heck? No. I'm just saying would your first instinct be to kiss your aunt firmly on the mouth and say, let's have a baby. I think Albus has been harboring some feelings over the years. That's disgusting. I need to stop saying things like that. And then on the next page, Scorpius says, I don't know whether to high five you or frown at you for kissing your aunt about 500 times. And then Albus says, Ron's an affectionate guy. I was trying to distract her, Scorpius. I did distract her. You could like hug her <laughs> you know there's other ways to show affection but who am i to judge <laughs> also they're in the ministry of magic and alohomora and polyjuice potions still work to infiltrate the ministry of magic you think that they would have updated their security in the 20 odd years since harry ron and hermione first infiltrated the ministry of magic this is the most plot hole filled story i think i have ever read you could strain your pasta through it. Oh my gosh. The big thing is that they didn't come up with a new story. We're just at the Triwizard Tournament again. And they're like, <laughs> they're just expelliarmusing his wand, Cedric's wand. Like there wouldn't be precautions in place to stop people in the stands from interfering. Like, I know that a big part of the story is playing off of nostalgia and that's why we were visiting the Triwizard Tournament and they wanted to make it equally about Harry Potter as well as Harry Potter's kids so this is why they wrote the story in this way but I really just want a story, a new story at Hogwarts following a new set of characters. We don't need to revisit and change the past. We already read this story. The only good thing to come out of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child was Scorpius Malfoy and Draco Malfoy. I love Draco Malfoy's character development and Scorpius was not as annoying as Albus, so yay. Honestly, I don't think I will ever read or watch any extra Harry Potter content for the foreseeable future because I'm mad that J.K. Rowling 
so desperately wants to destroy everything that was good about Harry Potter, but to cleanse my palate, I had to go back to the original. I had to read Harry Potter and the Prisoner of, nope, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire because I had to remind myself how the real Triwizard Tournament went. And guess what? Cedric Diggory was nice the whole time. None of that happened, so stop. Just stop it. Leave it alone. I gave all of them five stars because I cannot rate any of the original series anything lower than five stars. There's just so much nostalgia in this for me and I cannot see anything clearly except for the new stuff. Crimes of Grindelwald also was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mad now. The next book I read was another book that I read for the Bookmarked Book Club and another book that I had a hand in picking for our book club that I ended up not enjoying at all. It was Sorcerer of Thorns by Margaret Rogerson. It follows Elizabeth who grew up in one of the great libraries of her country surrounded by magical grimoires which are magic books. They teach sorcerers magic spells. Some of them contain such evil spells that they themselves turn into terrible monsters if provoked and you have to destroy them. An act of sabotage turns one of these magical grimoires into a terrible monster and Elizabeth has to destroy it after after it kills one of her mentors. Although she saved the day, she is implicated in the crime. She is accused of actually bringing it to life and killing her mentor. The only person who can help her is a sorcerer named Nathaniel Thorne. She grew up her entire life believing that sorcerers were evil because they created these terrible grimoires, so she doesn't love it, but he's the only one who believes her along with his servant named Silas. And Silas was the only character I actually cared about in this book. The only, <laughs> the only personality trait that Elizabeth was given was being tall. You know that Netflix movie, Tall Girl? That is Elizabeth. She's tall and that's it. She's tall, girl. Nathaniel was a lesser version of Will Herondale. He tried to be sassy and tried to be really charismatic, but he did not go all the way. Elizabeth was extremely naive. I know she grew up sheltered in a library, but there are books there. You can read them and not be so dumb, but you're a tall girl. That's all that you know is being tall. Also, the ending of this book. I don't want to spoil anything, but Elizabeth, the thing that happens with her that we learn about her is so dumb. Oh my gosh. All of this felt like YA of the past. It felt like something I would have loved when I was starting out with YA. I think that I would have loved everything about this, but now that we've kind of moved on in terms of plot devices and tropes, I expected more from it. So I liked two things. I loved Silas. I thought he was the only complex character in this entire world. And I love that it took place in libraries. I love that this was all about an appreciation of books, a love of books, how books have lives of their own, and really help you out if you're in a pickle. This could have been so much more. With that as a baseline, yes. But then so much no happened. So I gave it three out of five stars. I didn't hate it. I was just very underwhelmed. Again, this was for Bookmarked Book Club, so if you want to know more of my spoiler thoughts and Haley's spoiler thoughts, I will leave that down below. And actually, the next four books that I read, I did live shows for every single one of them because if we go on over here, <laughs> I read The Raven Cycle. We had a Raven Cycle read-along with Lala from Books and Lala. She is the one who set up this entire read-along. I love her so much. And I have a new friend, Kat from Paperback Dreams. Love her. And 
Elias, good old Elias. I loved the discussions that I had with them about the series because all of us had read the series before. So we all had old ties to the series, but we were also able to find something new in the series this time around. I love them so much that I convinced all of them to come on back together in November for the release of Call Down the Hawk, which is all about Ronin. So like I said, in September, I read all four of these books by Maggie Stiefvater. They are The Raven Boys, the Dream Thieves, Blue Lily, Lily Blue, and The Raven King. I read this one three times before, and so now I've read the first book four times, and then I read all four books during a 24-hour readathon, so they all blurred together in that 24-hour period. I remember liking the entire story, but I wasn't able to distinguish where one book ended and the other began. It was great to revisit this and read it more slowly and really analyze it with friends. So I gave the first book 4.5 out of 5 stars. I gave The Dream Thieves 4.5 out of 5 stars. This one was my least favorite when I read it the first time. And then we have my favorite, which is Blue Lily Lily Blue. I gave it 5 out of 5 stars. A masterpiece. So much happens in quite a small book. And then we have my least favorite of the series, which is The Raven King. I gave it four out of five stars. I still enjoy it. It was a satisfying ending objectively. I like where a lot of our characters ended up and I loved seeing the character development of our main cast of characters. The prophecies occurred and things did come back around, but some of my favorite characters were done so dirty. Important aspects of this book just happened. There wasn't any lead up to it. Not a lot of time was spent with the thing actually happening. We just glazed over it. We're just like, okay, that happened. Now moving on. But I wanted there to be more drama. It took four books to get there. We need to reap the benefits. So ranking them, Blue Lily Lily Blue is at the top. Then it's the Raven Boys. Then it's the Dream Thieves and then it is The Raven King. But all of them I do enjoy. I love character-focused fantasies, and that's what this is. I mean, it's more paranormal than fantasy, but you know what I mean. All of those live shows are down below because I can't talk about the spoilers, but I need you to know. The next three books I read were, again, more graphic novels. Fence Volumes 1, 2, and 3 by C.S. Picot. These are graphic novels that center around competitive fencing. It follows a teenager named Nicholas Cox who is given a sports scholarship to a boarding school if he is able to get on the competitive fencing team. If he isn't, then he has to leave the school. So the stakes are high. He really wants to be a competitive fencer because he is an illegitimate son to an Olympic fencer. He wants to prove that fencing is in his blood. He also has a rivalry with a fencing prodigy who has had the best training from birth, Saiji Katayama. He doesn't really have a lot of friends. All he knows is fencing. But the first three volumes have just been chronicling them trying to make it onto the fencing team. It has been a pretty drawn out start. I felt like we would be in the depths of the story by this point, but I mean, I love all of the characters and I believe all or most of them are part of the LGBT community. And I love the relationship dynamics that are building of them competing against one another to be the best fencer, but also they want to be friends and teammates. I never thought I would care about fencing, but here I am. <laughs> looking up fencing YouTube videos because I want to know how they do it and how quick some of these fencers are and wow. So even if you care 0% about sports like I thought I did, check out the series. I'm excited to see where the story goes because each volume that I read I enjoyed more and more as I got to know each of the characters. The first volume I gave 4 out of 5 stars, the second one I gave 4.5, and the third volume I gave 5 out of 5 stars. We finally hit our stride. We are past the grueling getting on the team, trying out for the team scenario, and now we're going to actually be competing against other schools and there's going to be more relationships brewing and all of that, but none of the other volumes are out yet. So I don't know when the story is going to continue. I really hope soon because I'm invested now. The second to last book that I read was And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. I gave this five out of five stars. I love murder mystery. I love Agatha Christie's writing style. The twists and turns she developed. She was one of 
the pioneers in mysteries, her and like Sherlock Holmes. Agatha Christie is only outsold by the Bible and Shakespeare. Wow! It turns out that I had first read this in 2017 for Booktubeathon. I never included it in a wrap up, I never included it on my Goodreads, so I wasn't actually sure if I had read this book before. I thought I had, but there was no evidence online except for a Booktubeathon vlog where I briefly talked about it. So I read it again just to be sure. Once I started this book, I knew how it was going to end up because I remembered the major plot twists of it, but it was still just as satisfying as reading it the first time, maybe even more so because I was able to pick up on the hints and see where she included like false leads and all of that, like the red herring. Ah. I listened to it while I was physically reading, so I was completely immersed in the murder mystery. I felt like I was in it, I was on Soldier Island, I was seeing all the bodies drop if you don't know what this book is about. It follows 10 strangers who were lured to an island off the coast of Devon. They don't know any of the other people there. They were brought there under suspicious circumstances and they think that maybe they're just supposed to have a nice holiday there except they can't get off the island and people one by one start dying. It starts to reflect a nursery rhyme called 10 Little Soldiers which um, back in the day was not called 10 Little Soldiers. I learned that on Wikipedia. I'm really happy that they changed it because yikes! Five out of five stars. I definitely want to read more Agatha Christie in the future. So far I've just read this and Murder on the Orient Express. I think Murder on the Orient Express is my favorite out of the two, but I definitely need to try out more. So if you have a favorite Agatha Christie, let me know down below. I really want to continue on. And then the last book that I read in September, the last book I read during a month, which could be classified partially as summer, <laughs> I read City of Ghosts by v. Victoria Schwab who is also known as V.E. Schwab, but when she's writing middle grade like this one is, it's Victoria Schwab. I gave this one three out of five stars. Again, I went into this expecting it to be, woo, great, but then the end just fizzled out. Why do I keep on? Maybe it's because I am so particular on how books end. There needs to be a reason why you invested this much time into the story. It needs to be satisfying. It just wasn't as epic of an ending as I was expecting. I know it's middle grade. There's a showdown with ghosts. It should be really exciting. It should be like, oh my gosh, will this 12 year old make it out alive? Again, I did love the concept of this book. I love ghosts. I love spooky ghosts especially. I think that they're so fun to read about. It kind of reminded me of more of like a Hocus Pocus Halloween Town type of spooky story. So we have our main character named Cassidy Blake who on her last birthday drowned in a frozen river. But a ghost, her new ghost friend named Jacob, somehow brought her back out of the afterlife and she came back to life but he also brought himself in ghost form back with her. So she is alive but can interact with the afterlife. She can pull back the veil and enter the ghost realm. And the only person who knows that she can see ghosts is her ghost best friend named Jacob. The ironic thing though is that her family, her parents, are known as the inspectors with an E. They have popular ghost hunting books and are about to film a new ghost hunting show in Edinburgh. And they cannot see ghosts. In fact, her dad actually does not think that ghosts exist at all. He is much more scientific about it all. There needs to be a different explanation to ghosts. And her mom is more like, oh yeah, I've seen ghosts before. She has not. She's a liar and we don't like her. <laughs> So during the summer, they head on over to Scotland to film the first episode of their TV show, and Cassidy is thrust into the city of ghosts. Some of the ghosts are more sinister than others and really want to come into our mortal world. She meets somebody who is like her, and that's all I'm going to say because it's a really short middle grade book. Again. I love spooky ghosts and this did spooky ghosts really well. I like how most of them weren't scary, they were just living their life 
living their- not living their life, they're dead. I like how Castie's role with ghosts changed throughout the book and it really set up what's going to happen in the next couple of books in the series. I'm not sure if I'm going to continue with the series. I might. I don't regret reading it because it really got me in the spooky October mood. I'm ready to be haunted by ghosts. Let's do this, my friends. Speaking of that, if you have any spooky book recommendations, please let me know down below. If they include ghosts, that'd be great, but it can be horror books, thrillers, maybe some spooky contemporaries, something that is set in October? I don't know. Please let me know down below. Let me know what you are going to be reading in October. Thank you for sitting through this very long video as my voice was slowly but surely dying. I think in the future I'm going to switch up how I do my wrap-up videos because, you know, they take a lot of time to film. I always wait too long to actually film my wrap-ups and then I feel like I have to rush through them and not actually give a really great review of them. So, for October, I am going to switch up my wrap-up style. Hopefully it's going to be better. I'm really excited to make some happy improvements to my channel and really mix up some of my content, really bring some life and some fun back into my channel. So thank you for dealing with me. Thank you for sticking around. I really appreciate it. And I love all of you. Thank ya. See y'all later. Hope you're reading a lot of good things. Bye.